you know that when the crusaders first came in contact with sugar they called it sweet salt and that's how they took it back to europe with them my name is dr kurish feroz dalal i'm an archaeologist and a culinary anthropologist and we're going to go on an incredibly sweet journey now the sugar that we eat essentially comes mainly from one source and that is sugarcane juice sugarcane juice is the juice of a very interesting grass called sugarcane and this grass originated in new guinea and in india simultaneously it was cultivated in india most probably as early as the 6th 7th century bc because we know for sure that it's mentioned in various different ways in ayurvedic texts dating back all the way to the 5th century bc so the charaka samhita and others talk about sugar and they talk about sugar in a purely medicinal manner and this is a very very interesting thing this early sugar or this sugar mass that was being created out of sugarcane juice was unwieldy and difficult to use and not very popular so it was only when we first started converting sugarcane juice by reducing it into jaggery and then from jaggery into a very crudely refined sugar sometime during the 5th century AD that sugar became incredibly popular all over india this sugar which we call khand or khand is known to us right from the period of the gupta empire itself and was a very very important export from india buddhist monks traveling to various parts of the world took it with them it was a high energy food and they took it all the way with them to china where they found sugar cane The Chinese on the other hand were fascinated by this product that could be made out of sugarcane and actually not just learned how to make it from the Buddhist monks but sent two specific embassies back and forth to the court of Harshavardhana of Thaneshwar in the late 7th century AD and we interestingly have uh, a lot of records of the Taizong emperor of the Tang dynasty talking about the process of sugar and the crystallization of sugar in China and the chinese then took this crystallization process to a completely different level much much later in china and ultimately sometime during the 17th century ad a very interesting enterprising chinese gentleman says legend called tom anchu first came to kolkata and set up a sugar refining industry at a small village which is now named after him called achipu now whether this is just uh, you know some kind of an urban myth or an absolute truth is difficult to tell but the fact remains that the word for crystallized tiny crystals independent crystals of sugar is chini and this is the word that we use to mention the chinese people and people of chinese descent so it's very very probable that it is tom anchu from china who's responsible for giving the name chini to granulated crystalline sugar in india but the fact that sugar probably has a much earlier history in india comes to us from the writings of niyakas who was one of the people who came with alexander the great and niyakas talks very specifically about sugar from india and after niyakas a number of roman historians talk about sugar including pliny the first who talks about sugar in a large way he talks about the sugar from india and the sugar from arabia and he goes on to say that the sugar from india is far superior to the sugar from arabia the crusaders who come down in the 11th 12th and 13th centuries ad to jerusalem and that region first come into contact with these large white cones of salt which they sweet and which they call sweet salt it is they who take back this sweet salt with them uh, the europeans try various different ways of cultivating salt and it's ultimately the venetians who managed to first cultivate sugarcane and they do so and have an almost complete strangle hold and monopoly on the sale of sugar in europe sugar is made in beautiful cones is transported long distances takes pride of place on tables and is scraped over various different delicacies so if you wonder why we have pastries and cakes which have a light dusting of sugar it's because back in those days that's the only amount of sugar you could afford to put on various different pastries it was only in the middle of the 15th century ad with the discovery of the canary islands 
that a truly good place to grow sugarcane was found by the Europeans and not very much after that the new world was discovered by Christopher Columbus. It was in this new world that large areas of Brazil and Suriname and ultimately the Caribbean islands were converted to sugar plantations. But sugar was a very very intensive crop to grow and the more sugar that became available and the more sugar became affordable to this was added the appetite for sugar that came up in the Americas itself. And to meet the demands of this, slavery was the only option. So sugar was indirectly responsible for the large scale escalation of slavery from Africa to the Americas. And almost every single grain of sugar that was produced was produced with the blood, sweat and tears of African slaves. Finally, at the end of the 18th century AD, when the Europeans realized what was happening, uh, a lot of people in Britain began to agitate against slavery. And it was only in the beginning of the 19th century that there was a movement to abolish slavery. But how could this slavery be abolished? How would this insane appetite for sugar be satiated? And it was for this that a new, perhaps even more drastic, and draconic slavery was instituted and it was now that the indentured labourers were brought in from various different parts of the world. Millions of indentured labourers from Africa and Asia, a large number of these from India, were transported by sea in inhumane and subhumane conditions, promised a great future and taken to the Caribbean islands to grow sugar and to Brazil to grow sugar and to various parts of South America. These people worked hard, sometimes with even less going for them than slaves did. And they changed once and for all the complete demographic of this region. It is because of the Indians that went there that the national foods of the Caribbean have such amazing Indian flavors that dal and chickpeas and chicken curries and rotis are now part of the cuisine and the culture of these areas. It is because of them that the Jamaican national dish is a roti and a red. Sugar is one of the few things that is responsible for industrializing the world on an amazing scale. It's also responsible perhaps for more blood, tears and toil than any other substance in the history of man.